Hello, I'm Abner Daniel. Today we will follow a case of one young girl was selling campfire mints in Spokane's West Central neighborhood. In the serene streets of Spokane, Washington, the year 1959 held promises of innocence and simplicity. But beneath the veneer of tranquility, a haunting mystery was about to unfold, leaving the town gripped in fear and disbelief. It all began with the spirited presence of nine-year-old Candace Rogers, affectionately dubbed Candy by those who knew her. With her dreams as vast as the open sky, she embarked on a seemingly ordinary mission to sell mints for her beloved campfire girls. Yet, as the sun dipped below, the horizon on that fateful March evening, Candy's footsteps faded into the shadows, leaving behind a trail of unanswered questions and unyielding despair. What followed was a relentless pursuit for truth, spanning over six decades, fraught with heart-wrenching discoveries, elusive suspects, and a chilling revelation that would redefine the very fabric of the community's trust. Everything will be revealed in the video that follows. Candace Rogers, who went by Candy, was born on July 18, 1949 in the American city of Spokane, Washington. She was the only child in the family, and shortly after her birth, her parents divorced. Her father stayed in the same city, so they spent time together pretty often. Candy was a typical, lovely child who enjoyed strolling outside with her friends, spending time in nature, and playing with her dog. She also had dreams of joining the Campfire Girls, a popular organization in those days, similar to the Boy Scouts, but exclusively for girls. They learned various useful skills, went on hikes, and enjoyed their time together as a group. In 1959, when Candy was nine, she finally had the chance to join this organization, and she was thrilled about it. One of the Campfire Girls' responsibilities was selling mints. The organization provided them with boxes of sweets and they had to go door to door, offering residents to buy them. On Friday, March 6th, Candy was supposed to do this after school. She returned home, had dinner, played with her dog, and around 4 p.m., she took about eight boxes of mints and headed out. Candy planned to walk through nearby streets and offer sweets to her neighbors. Other girls were also supposed to visit houses in this area, but they had pre-allocated streets to avoid overlapping and offering sweets to the same people. A few hours later, her mom began to worry as Candy still hadn't returned. She was supposed to be home by 6 p.m., but she was clearly delayed. With darkness falling, her mom decided to go out and search. Accompanied by Candy's grandfather, they walked the streets of their neighborhood, but Candy was nowhere to be found. Soon, some family friends and neighbors joined the search, wanting to help. But despite their efforts, they couldn't find any traces of Candy, so her mom decided to call the police. By that time, the streets had already darkened, and it had become increasingly clear that something bad might have happened to Candy. The police quickly joined the search, starting by questioning all the neighbors. They soon discovered that Candy had only sold one box of mints. This indicated that something might have happened to her shortly after leaving home. But one resident claimed to have seen the girl on a nearby street around 6.30 p.m. This was weird because by that time, Candy's mom was already out searching for her. Candy's grandfather also shared strange observations. When he went in search of his granddaughter and arrived on the same street mentioned by the witness who saw the girl, he almost got struck by a speeding car that even hit the curb. Unfortunately, he didn't see the license plate, but remembered it was a green 1953 Ford. Police distributed a description of the car, but weren't able to track it. Around 9 p.m., they discovered several mint boxes strewn along the road near a bridge. It was clear that these boxes belonged to Candy, heightening the overall concern. The police focused their search in this area, combing both riverbanks along with a small wooded zone on either side. They scoured the area all night, but couldn't locate Candy. By morning, news of Candy's disappearance spread through local newspapers, and soon, statewide media started covering the case. 
1959, child disappearances near their homes were unusual because it happened extremely rarely. The residents of Candy's town hadn't faced such a case in many years, leaving them deeply disturbed. Early the next day, police ramped up their efforts, deploying more officers. Mounted police, off-road vehicles, and even military personnel scanning the land from helicopters joined the search. Additionally, a vast number of volunteers, both from the city and nearby areas, joined the search efforts. In total, over a thousand people participated in the search, making it one of the most extensive in the country's history at that time. The search area extended to 11 miles around the girl's home, yet they still couldn't find her. On the same day, another tragic event unfolded. A helicopter involved in the search clipped power lines and crashed resulting in the loss of three out of the five crew members. Search efforts persisted for many days, yielding no results. Police officers continued working, literally around the clock, in multiple shifts, trying their best to locate Candy. Investigators received approximately 750 tips in the initial days of the search, diligently checking each one, but all led to dead ends. 15 days later, Two military members from the local base went into the woods west of Spokane on a hunting trip. There, they noticed children's shoes on the ground, immediately recalling Candy's disappearance. Many military members had been involved in the search, so they were all well aware of the case. They reported this discovery to the police, who showed the shoes to Candy's grandfather. He confirmed that the shoes indeed belonged to his granddaughter. The police headed to the woods for the search. Within minutes, one of the officers spotted a foot sticking from the bushes and found the girl's body. She lay amid the underbrush, covered with pine branches. Medical experts determined that the cause of death was strangulation. The perpetrator had used a torn piece of fabric from her skirt for this. Marks on Candy's hands and feet indicated she had been bound, although no ropes were found near the body. They also concluded that the victim had been sexually abused. During the search of the crime scene, police found a green car seat cover nearby, but they couldn't establish whether it had any relevance to the murder. On Candy's clothing, officers noticed a small purple stain that smelled like grape-flavored chewing gum. Yet, once again, they couldn't establish any connection to the case. Lacking any substantial leads that could lead them to the killer, the police tried to find any possible clues. Investigators sifted through incoming tips and explored the possible involvement of hundreds of individuals, neighbors, various suspicious characters, and previously convicted criminals. Soon, they focused their attention on a 50-year-old man named Alfred Graves. The reason he became a suspect was quite peculiar he took his own life on the same day Candy's body was discovered. He did it right in his car, not far from where the mint boxes were found. He also lived just a few hundred yards from Candy's home. When the police found Alfred's body, they discovered a rope and woman's hairpins in his car. Investigators obtained a search warrant for his house, where they found numerous newspaper clippings detailing articles on sexual crimes against women and girls. The police also learned that several women had accused him of harassment, and even his wife admitted suspecting him of Candy's murder. Despite this troubling chain of events, investigators couldn't find any evidence linking Alfred to Candy's murder. They hesitated to clear him of suspicion, but proving his guilt seemed impossible. Detectives delved into other suspects, whose numbers kept growing. Several months after the murder, they had an extensive list of names, spanning multiple pages, and the police diligently checked each one. Yet, every time, they failed to find evidence of their involvement. Later, investigators had another suspect, a serial killer named Hugh Morse. He was arrested in 1961 for a series of crimes, and the reason why he became a suspect was pretty interesting. Hugh was known for constantly chewing grape-flavored gum, as we recall, a similar substance was found on Candy's clothes. Another reason to suspect him was that he killed two women in Spokane a few months after Candy's death. Hugh began committing crimes pretty early. His first arrest was for assaulting a woman, but he faced no real consequences. He was simply discharged from the army where he was serving at the time. Later, 
he committed a series of robberies in Los Angeles and served only six months. After his release, he lured two eight-year-old girls to a secluded area, promising them ice cream. He sexually assaulted them and was arrested once again. Surprisingly, he managed to avoid prison. A medical commission deemed him a sexual psychopath, so he was placed in a mental health facility. After two years, doctors believed he was cured and released him. Hugh moved to Spokane, where he started peeping into women's windows. In November 59, he broke into a 28-year-old woman's home, assaulted and killed her. Ten months later, he entered a 69-year-old woman's residence, repeating the same actions as with the previous victim. A month later, he assaulted another woman, stabbing her multiple times, but she survived. After these crimes, he left the city and over the next few months, committed numerous other offenses, attacking women and girls with a knife, sexually assaulting them, and killing two more victims. Hugh always traveled between different cities and states until the FBI took on his case. He was added to the list of the country's 10 most wanted criminals and was soon captured. He was sentenced to multiple life terms and Hugh attempted to end his life in his cell. However, he was saved by the guards and continued to serve his sentence. Detectives in Candy's case repeatedly visit him in prison, but the man denied any involvement. He also went through a polygraph test, which indicated he was telling the truth. However, this tool carries no weight in court due to its questionable accuracy. Considering Hugh's biography and the fact that he lived in Spokane at the time of the murder, investigators viewed him as their primary suspect. But he continued to deny any involvement, and the police lacked any evidence linking him to the killing. Later, the police focused on another suspect, a 49-year-old man named Howard Barnett. In February 1960, he was arrested on suspicion of molesting a minor girl. A few days after the arrest, he took his own life in his cell at the Spokane police station. Before this, he wrote a message on the wall in his own blood, stating, I have a sin before the Lord. His wife learned of her husband's arrest only after his death. Speaking to the police, she asked if he killed that girl, referring to Candy. Detectives began investigating his potential involvement, yet, once again, they failed to find any evidence of his guilt. Howard remained one of the main suspects, mainly because he lived on the next street to the victim. Over the course of many years, police continued their efforts on this case, gathering new leads and examining other suspects. At one point, a woman contacted them, claiming that on the day Candy disappeared, she saw a green car following the girl. Investigators once again focused their efforts on locating this specific vehicle. However, this didn't lead to any substantial results. Although, it was strange that this woman chose to reveal this information many years after the crime. In the following decades, this case was reopened from time to time, but detectives always hit a dead end. Interestingly, they not only had to search for new leads, but also fend off false confessions. In total, 13 individuals confessed to Candy's murder, but in each case, the police concluded that they were lying. These individuals couldn't provide any information that only the killer would know, often just repeating details from the newspapers. Surprisingly, such behaviors are common in high-profile cases. For some reason, people confessing to crimes they did not commit. Throughout the time, the police department saw numerous changes in detectives, each hoping to solve this crime. Candy's murder stood out as one of the most prominent and mysterious cases, not only in their city, but across the entire state. It impacted a significant number of people. Before the murder, parents felt safe letting their children play outside. But after this case, many reconsidered their views on safety. In the early 2000s, this case was reopened once again. And this time, a new detective decided to use modern technologies. Fortunately, in 1959, the police had diligently collected and preserved all the evidence, which allowed experts to find a sample of male semen on Candy's clothing. Considering it had been stored for several decades, examining the sample proved extremely challenging. But after extensive efforts, experts managed to extract a DNA profile. They uploaded it to the FBI database, but unfortunately, there was not a single match. 
Detectives also cross-examined the profile with samples from numerous suspects, but none of them turned out to be Candy's killer. Throughout all these years, many were convinced that Hugh Morris was behind the crime. However, the forensics indicated he had no connection to this murder. As a result, the investigation once again hit a standstill. The police had a DNA sample from the person who sexually assaulted and killed Candy, but uncovering their identity remained quite a challenge. The case was once again reopened in 2021, and a new detective decided to try an innovative DNA analysis method, genetic genealogy. This technique had successfully solved hundreds of cold crime cases, and the detective hoped it would finally bring closure to one of the longest standing investigations. He contacted several laboratories specializing in this analysis, but there he was faced with disappointment once again. To utilize this method, experts needed to examine the original DNA sample. Several attempts were made, but each laboratory concluded that the semen sample had degraded too much, so it was impossible to extract the necessary data. The detective turned to a final laboratory, and unexpectedly, there was a long-awaited breakthrough. Using cutting-edge tools, the experts successfully studied the sample, providing them with the required profile of the perpetrator. They uploaded the profile to genealogical databases, initiating the search for distant relatives of the DNA owner. Through meticulous efforts, examining thousands of individuals, they narrowed down their focus to one specific family. Upon investigating this family, they found that the DNA sample most likely belonged to one of three brothers. However, a new challenge arose as all three were deceased. Nonetheless, the experts and the detectives discovered that one of the brothers had a daughter, and the police contacted her. The woman was shocked at the possibility of her father being the killer of a little girl, yet without hesitation, she agreed to assist. She provided her own DNA sample, and the experts confirmed that she was closely related to the individual whose semen was found on Candy's clothing. With these results, detectives swiftly obtained a court order for the exhumation of her father's grave. Experts extracted a DNA profile from his remains, and after 62 years since the murder, the identity of the perpetrator was finally revealed. It was a man named John Hoff. The analysis revealed a complete match between John's DNA and the semen found on Candy's clothing. Despite having hundreds of suspects throughout the years, John Hoff was never on that list. Investigating his biography, detectives discovered his involvement in other crimes. At the time of Candy's murder, he was 20 years old and lived less than a mile from her house. He also served in the army, stationed at a base near where the girl's body was discovered. Two years after the murder, he attacked a woman, bound and sexually assaulted her, and attempted to kill but she managed to survive. John was arrested and sentenced to only six months in prison. He was also disgracefully discharged from the army. Upon release, John started a family, having four children, two sons and two daughters. He remained off the police radar, living a seemingly ordinary life. John changed jobs several times, and once, while working in a food packaging plant, he suffered a severe chemical burn to his face, leaving a lasting mark. His life came to an end in June 1970, 11 years after Candy's murder, when John took his own life without leaving a note. Police also determined that the victim might have known him. Candy was friends with his sister, who was 10 years old at the time. All these years later, she told detectives that after her friend's murder, she cried in her brother's arms, unaware that he was the one who killed Candy. Unfortunately, the girl's parents did not live to see the moment when the killer's identity became known. Candy's mother passed away in 2006, and her father took his own life in 1963, four years after the tragic event. The reason for this remains unknown, leaving only speculation that he couldn't cope with the loss of his own daughter. Nevertheless, this case was finally solved marking it as one of the longest investigations. Over 62 years, it involved not just different detectives, but different generations. During the press conference, where the police announced the name of the killer, only one officer who worked on the investigation 
in 1959 was present. He thanked God, allowing him to live such a long life and eventually learn the truth. As for John's daughter, initially she couldn't believe that her father committed such a heinous crime. Later, she accepted this fact, calling her father a monster who took the life of an innocent girl. She expressed regret that he was not held accountable during his lifetime. Interestingly, John took his own life exactly when his daughter turned nine, the same age as Candy. Whether there's any connection remains unknown, and we may never find out. All right, guys, share your thoughts on this story in the comment section, and don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. Thank you for watching.